we'll hopefully get some clarity on that a little bit later on in the day. But, but let's move to, to, to what you're here to discuss today, which is, of course, the, the investment, £650 billion worth of an investment in getting people back to work. Just, just explain a little bit about it and where that money is going to be spent. Well, we've seen um, a variety of ways the money will be spent, whether it's uh, aspects of infrastructure, continuing support, uh, uh, but I think a more tangible element for our view your viewers would be two and a half billion pounds to go into rebuilding of schools or where repairs are needed there. Uh, I'm conscious that uh, we expect that to include about 425,000 jobs being created. Mm -hmm. So we continue to make sure our plan for jobs, which we believe is working, but how we continue to invest in that so we can help people not only get back into work, but to get on in work and to increase their take-home pay. And that really matters to us. How do you justify a Conservative assertion that you are committed to getting people back into work with removing the £20 uplift to universal credit? Well, the £20 uplift was specific to recognise the shock that happened, particularly for people newly coming into benefits um, of what happened with coronavirus. Uh, we do want to make sure that people, as I say, are getting aspects of more training on skills. Uh, there have, I think there's been uh, over 80,000 apprenticeship starts, helped by the incentive we've given by employers to take people on. Over 60,000 young people are in kickstart. But overall, we're seeing employment rise month after month after month, and we want to continue that, uh, uh, that people getting in, but also things like the Lifetime Skills Guarantee, helping them get a paid, better paid job. Okay, even, even more straightforward question, why are we getting rid of the £20 uplift? Because it was a temporary measure recognised for the extent but it's, but it's of the COVID pandemic. I mean, that, that's not an answer. I mean, saying that it was a temporary measure, you could carry on with it if it was proved to be working effectively. It has been proved to be working effectively. Well, the the in terms of uh, you talk about working effectively, it was there. It was a, an element there to protect people, particularly those initially coming into benefits for the first time. We want to make sure we make the shift into all about plan for jobs, and it's the ongoing investment in that uh, where we're seeing people get back into work, and we want people to get on in work. I mean, this this. Was the, this was the argument you gave, I think, actually, on this programme back in July when, when, we, when we spoke last about this, that, you know, it's all about getting people back into work. But this, this is an in-work benefit. Correct. A third of people who are on it are in work. A third of people who are on it, basically, we're, we're, I'm playing around with the numbers slightly here, but a third of people are, are looking for work. You know, are you entirely happy with this? Yes, uh, we made this decision earlier in the year. The Chancellor announced it in the budget. And that's why we're building up the update to the plan for jobs to make sure that as we see the end of the furlough scheme, so the support that's happened there, as we see the end of the other support schemes that we've put in place during this time of COVID, that we accelerate pounds, our plan for jobs. How does taking £1,000 away from some of the lowest, you know, the, uh, some of the poorest people in this country, how does that help them get back into work? Well... It was a temporary stopgap, as I've pointed out, for people. Um, the uplift was done. It made it in line with uh, the statutory sick pay, uh, the basic uh, pay that people could have if they were out of work uh, for other reasons. Um, but I'm conscious that we want to keep working with our now 27,000 work coaches around the country. We've got over 200 extra job centres supporting people getting to work, but also to progress in work as well. 660,000 people, according to Unite the Union, 660,000 key workers will have a negative impact on their bank balance as a result of this. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation says half a million more people being face, pull, being, fa face being pulled into poverty, including 200,000 children. Citizens' advice are warning that a third of people on universal credit will end up in debt when the extra payment is removed. All of those taken together, and you tell me that you personally are happy to see this go. Well, if I think about the £20 up week, that's uh, just about two hours of national minimum wage. That's why we are working through our work coaches with people uh, on low pay who may well be in work about what we can do to help them get more hours or indeed to get the skills in order to get a higher paid job. We've already lifted the national uh, minimum wage, so it's about 60% of median earnings. So 500,000 the... people being dragged into poverty. As I've pointed out, uh, well, there's an element we can get into discussion about how poverty metrics mm -hmm. are done as whether they're uh, relative measures and all the other things. The point is, there are definitely vacancies out there. We are there with 27,000 work coaches to help people, as I say, get into, but also get on in work. And that's what really matters as well, the progress that we can help people get on in work. But let's, let's just take all of this together. You know, we're seeing a cut to the universal credit uplift. We're seeing an increase in next national insurance contributions. We're seeing plans to freeze the income tax at personal allowance. Labour, and you can, ch you can challenge the figures, they say that this will cost ordinary workers, social care workers, nurses, the like, £1,000 a year, more than that. Now, you may dispute the figures, but you're not going to sit there and tell me that people are going to be better off as a result of all those changes. 
Well, I'm conscious that it's about 15% of the top earners who will pay for half of the total revenues of the new national insurance levy from next year. But there's other, all of the sorts of support that we do put in to try and help people. If I think about the £6 billion that is spent on childcare, on average, that's about £5,000 per family that we put in there to help them support with, with those other measures. So there's a variety of ways that government tries to help families in order to be more prosperous, as well as uh, structural elements like continuing to increase the national living wage. But, but again, you're not telling me that people are going to be better off as a result of the next change, the income tax freeze, <laughs> and indeed that's what we're talking about today, the universal credit uplift. Well, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, in terms of aspects of jobs, for those people who only work a certain number of hours, we'll be seeing what we can do to help them perhaps increase that number of hours, but also uh, recognising that we want to help them get a higher wage. Uh, and that's important. Things like the £650 billion, the 425,000 jobs with that, is a real opportunity for people to upskill, uh, and we're seeing that coming through. Away from your brief, but, 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 but one of your colleagues around the Cabinet uh, table, and um, Priti Patel has once again been found out to have been holding private meetings with, with well, in this occasion, with a billionaire uh, of her acquaintance without informing officials until after the fact. This was, in essence, what she got sacked for before when she was International Development Secretary. When can we expect her resignation? Well, I don't know the details of what you set out. Uh, what I'm, I'm aware of, that sometimes people... You do end up meeting people... Um, perhaps by accident, and you have a conversation. The important thing is you pass... Me by accident, though. That's the whole point of this story. She arranged a meeting, took place in a hotel. She well, knew it was coming. You know, one of the things, if you are not there with the private secretary, is that you pass the information on mm. to the officials, uh, and then it's dealt with by the private office. Uh, it's, um, I know my own experience, you sometimes do see people, as long as you pass on the information, that's what matters uh, to make sure that the civil servants have the record and they can declare that in the appropriate way. Shouldn't that declaration be made in advance of a meeting and not after it, potentially when someone finds out that you've been having a meeting and you rush to give the permanent secretary a phone call? Well, say, I don't know now the precise details of what you're referring to. Uh, I'm, I have met somebody actually while I was on holiday, didn't know them at all, uh, but it turns out they were a supplier to uh, DWP. So, again, I share the fact that, by chance, at somebody's party, I met somebody who was there. So it's those sorts of things where, uh, I don't, as I say, I don't know the details are pretty, uh, but it's important we just make sure it's transparent in that regard with our civil servants and they can use the information accordingly. You are the very vision of probity. Uh, Therese Coffey, good to have you on the programme. Thanks Thank for joining you. us.